With the general idea of the game being forged, they knew there wouldn't be a game if there was no conflict to endure. This is where the evil robotic businessmen named COGS come in. Their goal is to instead of promote the wonderfully Toonie Land, they would take over the vibrant, happy-go-lucky streets of Toontown and replace it with a black and white metropolis covered all over with gigantic skyscrapers lurking over the sidewalks. COGS come in four different types. Cellbot, Cashbot, Lawbot, and Bossbot. With 8 cogs of each type, there are 32 different cogs in total, and some range from level 1 to even level 12. And not only that, but there are also extra varying versions of cogs, including V2 cogs, which after being defeated explode into their inner workings and have to be defeated again. Another varying cog type being Virtual Skelecogs, which are hologram versions of cogs and do not earn you any experience or rewards upon defeating them. The true origin of these cogs is mostly unknown, however there was once a flash animated downloading screen created for Toontown that featured Scrooge McDuck visiting his friend and machine inventor Giro Gearloos. Scrooge McDuck was checking up on the inventions Giro was creating for Toontown when he suddenly stumbled upon an evil robot with a note on it stating, Do not touch. Scrooge, being the money grubber he is, realized that such a machine could make a ton of money, and because he had made investments in Giro's work, he felt he had the right to activate the robot despite the warning. This woke up the gigantic robot, which began to use Giro's technology to build evil robots to take over Toontown. It is not known if this story is canon or not, since the movie has since been taken off of the Toontown website. However, one neat fact though is that this intro actually shares a lot of artistic similarities to Carl Banks' DuckTales comics, with the entire video being done in a sort of animated comic book style. In fact, there actually was a bit more to the Toontown story than actually seen in the game. There was once an actual ending to the game, of which Jesse Shell describes, Originally, yes, there was an ending. I still have a horribly crude sketch of it, somewhere, there was a notion that when you defeated all four COG headquarters, there was a final challenge. But we all decided that this wouldn't work well with the game being ongoing, so the final battle was never developed. Jesse Shell said, We needed some kind of enemy, and early design involved everything the kids hate. So, there was an evil school teacher, an evil dentist, things like that. At some point though, the notion of the evil corporation seemed to be the strongest, simplest, and mo most defensible, and the work versus play sort of bubbled out of that. However, it would be untrue to say the development of the COGS was a completely smooth road. In the alpha version of the game, COGS were nothing more than regular businessmen, not robots. Also, they were not called COGS, they were called suits. After these suits were defeated by Toons, they would transform into little clowns and run away. Roy Disney Jr., the same gentleman who complimented Shell's efforts on Toon Tag, found this to be disrespectful to the great businessmen who helped make Disney the company it is today. Obviously an understandable complaint considering his father was a very successful senior executive for the Walt Disney Company, the VR studio vice president told the Toontown team to either remove the suits or the game would be cancelled. In response to the VP's concerns, the Toontown team told them that they would replace the suits with evil robots, which satisfied the concerns brought up by their executives. However, it was never mentioned that these new evil robots would actually be evil business robots. Thankfully, by the time that the game was actually released, no one minded the COGS and in the end actually allowed for some creative enemies than simply regular businessmen. When crafting the battling system to be used in Toontown Online, the team figured using business terms like Paradigm Shift or Eviction Notice would be a great idea for battling COGS. However, they had to figure a way that Toons could battle back. They came up with gags and in the process of making them, constructed a huge list of possible gags and slowly whittled down the list. They even consulted animator Bruce Woodside on the gags because of his large experience with Disney, aiding them with thinking of fresh ideas based on classic cartoon elements. Ideas such as a flower pot coming down and landing on a cog's head, to which the cog reaches up and pops his head back up after being buried by the falling flower pot. 
The battles between the cogs and the tunes work in a turn-based combat system, with each gag track going in different orders and affecting the other gag track's outcomes. Each round of fighting requires a lot of strategy if you plan to get out alive, especially considering using some gag tracks alongside other certain gag tracks. You may just end up undoing the effect of the other gag if not chosen wisely. In order to get better and more powerful gags, Toons will constantly need to be using their current gags against the appropriately leveled cogs, gaining them a boost in experience points until they have reached the correct amount of points to earn a brand new and improved gag. Of course, the usually lengthy and tedious nature of this gag training process can be alleviated by participating in cog battles during cog invasions, which is where an endless amount of certain cogs invade the streets for an allotted amount of time. This makes gag experience count for double its original amount, making gag training much quicker and much more manageable. Jesse Shell stated the reason for the team choosing this type of battle system is because we thought it might have a cross-gender appeal. That is, the boys would like the action, while the girls would feel more comfortable with the fact that you can take your time to make a decision. Compared to playing some other real-time games, we foolishly thought it would be less work than creating a real-time combat system. However, after reflecting on the amount of work it took balancing the battling system, Jesse Shell now says, Looking back, real-time combat would have actually been easier. One thing that is also vital to combat is how the battles will always happen in plain sight, so that newer players will be able to play the role of an audience member and watch a battle play out right before their eyes without actually having a risk of losing. This allows them to pick up on strategies to have a successful battle early on in the game. Like most MMOs everywhere, Toontown features a task system where Toons can go to the Toon headquarters and select from a wide variety of different tasks. There are tons and tons of possibilities of the exact tasks Toons can choose from, with only a handful that every single Toon will get making each individual experience a bit more unique, and it makes creating a new Toon and going through the game again even more satisfying. Of course, in the end, the Toon tasks follow the same structure throughout. As you progress through the game, as one would expect, toon tasks gradually begin to ramp up difficulty and length. Some toon tasks will really make you work for your reward, but in the end are actually benefiting you as it helps prevent grinding for better gags since you're getting a lot of experience just by doing what the toon tasks require you to do. Rewards for these tasks are things like being able to hold more gags, training for a new gag track, larger jelly bean jars, being able to teleport to a certain area in the game, and increasing your life. Toon tasks also do keep things simple enough to accommodate for players who simply do not have a lot of time on their hands. Even when toon tasks begin to become longer, it's still very easy to get a lot done with your toon tasks, only by playing about an hour or two. Mark Mine, Joe Shashe, and Roger Houston of to the Toontown team have said, since casual gamers typically have less time available for playing games, it was important to design Toontown to support short-term play. We included activities such as fishing and mini-games that can be accomplished in just a few minutes. We included a Toon Task system to give players explicit and measurable goals such as defeat three cogs. This makes it easier for the player to always know what to do and give them the satisfaction when they accomplish the short-term goals. During Toontown's second beta, a true Toontown fandom was starting to actually form. In mid-2002, the Toontown fan site, Toontown Central, now known as MMO Central, was created by Nick Fritzkowski. It featured multiple forums to discuss the various aspects of the game and areas to organize events to participate in the game itself. It became a very popular website for early adopters of the game as it let them meet and chat with other players without the in-game communication restrictions. Not only that, but Toons soon began to create their own clans. In response to this growing fandom, Jesse Shell said, We were hoping, hoping, hoping for these kinds of fan sites, and we were thrilled when it started to happen. The purpose of these were to hone in on various features like gag training or toon task completing to make them not only easier to complete, but also make them more enjoyable as well. The site was very significant because it helped spread word about Toontown across the internet and to show people that Toontown was beginning to develop its own following. In a very surprising turn of events, despite Disney executives originally interpreting that the only aim of the game would actually be just to the appeal of children and have just a safe environment for them to play in, 
A lot of players actually ended up being adults. Adults would often be introduced to the game by their children and try it out themselves. They would soon find out that there was much more to the game than what meets the eye. This led to adults creating their own account and tune to be able to spend more time with their kids and create more memories in the process. In fact, what ended up actually happening is that there were plenty of adults without any kids at all, and teenagers too that played the game frequently and were usually some of the best players in the game. This was actually intentionally put into the design of the game, and Jesse Shell responded to this saying, It was a very hard battle. Many execs we had to deal with could just not comprehend the point of view. There was a lot of pressure, for example, to take out the office humor of the Cox, because kids will never get that. But we knew if the game were to succeed, it would have to be as a collaboration between kids and parents. In recent years, I've had Disney execs come to me and say, you won't believe this, but a huge percentage of Toontown and Pixie Hollow players are adults. Which of course, was our plan all along. Keep in mind, the creative team that developed Toontown came from Disney Imagineering. We just used the same design principles that make theme parks work, and we brought them online.